Hello, Mets Up fans. Yeah, it's a, it's a real somber episode. It's a real disappointing episode. It's a real... Ah, it's a, you're going to get a lot of those. You're going to get a lot of ahs, <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of groaning and moaning, because boy, oh boy, do our New York Mets stink right now. My goodness, has this team season done a complete 180 and is looking so terrible right now. We were kind of negative last episode. It's going to get a little more negative this episode after a embarrassing series against the Miami Marlins. Bad baseball all around. Not many things redeeming coming from this series. We're going to talk about it. It's not going to be fun. You'll probably get some good takes. You'll probably get some good laughs. There's going to be a lot of... (laughs) If you'd like to see me and James, like I said, moan and groan, this is going to be the episode for you. But if you're one of these positive Mets fans, it's pretty tough to be positive after this series, of course. We also went to Brooklyn to go see the Cyclones, got to interview three prospects that we teased in the last episode, told you guys we were going to get three big names, and we did. We got Francisco Alvarez, we got Ronnie Mauricio, and we got Jalen Palmer, all for interviews. They're going to be featured during the farm report that we normally do during the midweek episodes over the next few weeks here. So like once a week, we'll drop these interviews instead of a midweek farm report. And we'll, you know, get to see what our interview sound like with Francisco Alvarez and Ronnie Mauricio. Of course, if you guys want to watch a video version of everything that we do over here, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, Met Stub Podcast. Our last video popped off. I think it might be our best one yet. So appreciate mm-hmm. you guys showing the, showing the support over there. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Met Stub. Make sure you also follow James on Twitter at Jeter Had No Range, me at Giraffe Neck Mark perfect time to bring in james here james how are we feeling after this series after the series i feel really just downright awful it's good it's so weird coming off the high we had today being with the cyclones all day and landing those big interviews to now come back remember the four games that have happened for the mets and be able to get into our uh, our zone per se for this show well, we talked about it on like the walk to the car and everything. We're like, damn, we got to talk about this miserable, miserable team right now after what is probably one of the best days that we've had in a very long time. Especially because the game today was at noon, Thursday. The Thursday's Mets game was at noon. So by the time we got to Brooklyn and got our stuff straightened away and figured out what we were doing, it was already over. The series was already outside of my mind. Like the Marlins were completely behind me, behind us. And now we have to... F- Rechannel it, and I'm not that excited to do that. No, I'm not excited to go through these games, but alas, we will, and we'll get it started <laughs> off with game one. And God, from the rip, it was so friggin' bad. I mean, we gave up a grand slam to Lewis Brinson, who is a sorry excuse for a major league baseball player. We, uh, I think we taught Lewis Brinson how to hit this week because he was hitting laser beams all over lone cap lowercase l depot park. It also just sucks that he was the fourth hitter of the game and he hit a grand slam. How often does that happen? Howie and Wayne were making fun of the Marlins lineup. Like, oh, after the trade deadline, this lineup really falls off a cliff. Just three real hitters there. Then it's all over. And then bang, Lewis Brinson does it to him. Dude, Gary hates Lewis Brinson for some reason. He, that makes sense. Every single time he sees Lewis Brinson play, I mean, shits down his throat almost like it's skyline <laughs> chili. It's crazy the animosity he has for a guy who's really irrelevant. But boy, did he make us pay this series. The Mets, pitching-wise, were not particularly sharp. They weren't the bad, but they weren't sharp, I would say. There were definitely a lot of mistakes made. And for some reason, Luis Brinson and Isan Diaz, who just haven't been able to hit the side of a barn, were <laughs> able to hit baseballs this week. It's hard to call Luis Brinson irrelevant because he was like a major prospect, central part of the Christian Yelich trade. And I think that Gary, I think Keith and Ron will probably share the same sentiment. They don't like him because every single time he plays against the Mets, or every single time he's ever played against anybody as a professional, he just swings at every single pitch. He doesn't take a pitch. He doesn't really care about recognizing a pitch, understanding a situation, working a count. He's just there to hack. And this time he did hack. And the shame of it all was that it wasn't even a bad pitch that he hit out. Like, it was 95 on the black. McGill made his pitch, and Lewis Brinson just hit a bang. It was just a crazy shot off it. Yeah, I mean, just shouldn't be in that situation anyway against these Marlins hitters. They're just not very good. We talked about it going into the series. Like, this is a team we should beat, but I unfortunately called it to a friggin' T, and I said, Mm. this is a huge trap game or trap series, and I'm not feeling good about it. And game one, four runs in the first, it's just not the start you want to see. 
No, this, the series basically felt over when that ball went over the fence. And the Mets did, like, scratch and claw, like, right afterwards to get back in the game. Javi had the walk, and he scored on the wild pitch, then he was limping around. Drury had an RBI double, then Pete had a home run, and that was all in the next three innings. And then that was just complete curtains for the offense after that. The vaunted Marlins bullpen, who could forget them? Can't yeah. get any hits off that team. Big names like Anthony Bass. <laughs> David Hess. The names that you throw out there. Like, they do have a couple good arms. I know you like Bender a lot. I love Bender. Floro's a piece. He saved two games against the Mets this week. Um, I guess it's kind Thompson. of Thompson. Yeah, I, David Campbell. Like, they have created player names. We like to talk about <laughs> Chase Anderson as created player. The Marlins are, I, I'm confident, creating players, but they were getting outs. That's the All-American bullpen we just named. Just a lot of good old-fashioned, like, Midwestern names. Dudes from Kansas, Nebraska, yeah, Iowa. real American names. This just was, it was doomed from the get-go. That Grand Slam really just put us in a hole that we couldn't ever really come back from. And mm-hmm. it's a shame because McGill's really pitched well all year, and this is the first time that he's really had sort of trouble. But even then, it was only the first inning. No, he, I thought, settled in really nicely after that Grand Slam and responded well to the adversity of giving up a lot of runs at one time for the first time in his career i know that probably sounds kind of dumb to the listeners to say that mcgill pitched pretty well after he gave up four runs but he did like a rookie pitcher in that situation with a team reeling you've given up a nuke in the first inning like you could really unravel but tyler mcgill settled in and gave us much needed length he got through five innings in a way that really was able to help this team without an off day and i'll say it again but that pitch to brinson wasn't even fucking bad it reminded me so much of that Marcelo Zuna home run off of Edwin last year in the ninth inning. Why you gotta do that to me? Why you gotta make me remember that when I'm already s- down? <laughs> it's it's late. It was the same thing though. It was just a, a fastball on the black that he just went with. He took it where it had to go, and only three of those runs were earned because of the James McCann interference, which was the most lackadaisical catcher's interference I've ever seen. I've never seen a catcher interference not be met. By some type of argument, either from the pitcher, the catcher, or the bench. Everyone's like, oh yeah, that was interference. He did like, it. I, I interfered. I interfered. Go take your base. I'm sorry. My bad. Won't happen again. But then he kind of changed his pitch mix a little bit after the first inning. He went very, very changeup heavy. Actually threw more changeups than fastballs from the first inning on. Which is a big change from the guy we've seen. Because I've said it over and over again in this podcast, breaking down his start. That he has been like a living in that 60% fastball zone. And he also kind of gave up on his slider after the first inning. He threw six of the 12 he threw the entire game in that inning alone. So Tyler McGill now has completely fallen in love with his changeup, as am I. The pitch is gross. Again, I'll say it, as I've said every single time, it's shocking that no one said this changeup was such a weapon before he came up. And, like, it's really cool that even though he only has three pitches and really only able to focus in on two... He has not been predictable with them, which is like the main reason he's finding success at such a young age. And that's a veteran move from a young pitcher, something that makes me feel really confident in the future of Tyler McGill. Yeah, if you want to take some positive out of it, it's that, you know, like you said, it's it's a cop out, but he did pitch well after giving up four, which whatever you want to take from that. From a young pitcher, I think it's important to see that he didn't give up, especially when we've had guys like Steven Matz who were known to avalanche. So he didn't avalanche. That's big. David Peterson, king of the avalanche. Yeah, they. we have some young pitchers that have had some trouble with that in the past. He fought back. He didn't have his best stuff, but he still relatively kept us close. Relatively. No, he, against this Marlins team and Jesus Lazardo, who looked all right. Nothing special. Fine. Yeah, it's the first time Jesus Lazardo started the game in two months. So I was hoping that we'd be able to hit him a little bit and did feel like we were chipping away and making him work a lot in that second, third, and fourth inning. We just couldn't. Or third, fourth, and fifth, whenever we scored the runs. It just wasn't like enough it's to just, really it's, knock it's him risp. out of the zone. It's risp again. The risp <laughs> is just so it's I don't know, I don't even know anymore. It's gotta be so in this team's head. It's gotta be a mental block. hundred percent. There's no doubt in my mind it's a mental block. Every time they step up with runners in scoring position, it's like these guys tighten up. We're back to the start of the year. Go figure that this New York Mets team right now, this healthier team, lost a series against the Marlins. And we had a triple-A, double-A roster going up against the Marlins. And we felt like those games were much more redeemable than what we saw this week. They were at least more fun. Like, there were guys, like, fighting, clawing, scratching, tooth and nail. Like, everyone there was really amped up to be playing baseball. This team felt so lifeless this entire series. My God, it was painful. I feel like that always happened to the Mets when we head to Miami. There's no crowd. There's no vibes. It's like a weird, dark tint inside that stadium. It's just... 
There was no juice. This team needs juice, and we had none of it. I always love to talk about how like this team is so reliant on the crowd and so reliant on the energy, and you just said that. But I'm also so sick and tired of them seemingly not being able to show up unless they are amped for this game. And they just, they weren't amped this entire series. Nothing like you just said. Conforto didn't start this game. I think that's worth noting as well. Mm -hmm. He got benched, which I think well, he, was... He's just not playing against lefties anymore. And I think that's pretty fair given his monumental struggles against them. Yeah, he's been god-awful. He talked about his WRC plus being 50. I can't imagine it's much higher. No, I I dropped the meme today from Mets up, like the uh, Fred Scooby-Doo meme of pulling off Michael Conforto's mask and revealing Kirk Newen Heist, because that's how it feels right now, Michael Conforto. He, he's either taking a walk or he's just getting out pretty uncompetitively. Swing is looking ugly like Kirk Newen Heist, too. My thing with Kirk Newen Heist when he played, I was like, I'm not sure if he's actually left-handed. <laughs> and that's where I'm starting to fall with Michael Conforto right now, despite seeing what we've seen in the past. I know it's still only 100 or 90 games have been playing awful, but my God, it's terrible. But not his fault why we lost this game. The offense didn't show up. We gave up runs early, tried to rally a little bit late, but it didn't help. And then May kind of struggled, too, when he came in at the end. Didn't help keep it close. Yeah, that kind of was the nail in the coffin because we did have a rally in the eighth. VR pinch hit for McCann, which is interesting because that was not Conforto. And then Drury hit for himself against Riley, which again was not Michael Conforto. But just couldn't do it. Just not enough. And then, of course, when Conforto came up in the ninth as a pinch hitter in a three or four run game, whatever it was, he laced a double. But that's the classic Conforto. The dude, when the game doesn't matter, he will show up. When <laughs> there's nothing to fight for, Michael Conforto's there. It's the A-Rod. It is such the A-Rod. And I hated that. I hated that whole narrative that would go around Mets Twitter but god I've bought into it because <laughs> in the biggest year of his career and all that he has disappeared so game one loss terrible can, awful. I, can I give can I give a bad joke yeah give a bad joke we're playing the Marlins and Conforto has floundered oh that's terrible that's, that's a awful. bad joke that's, that's a terrible. bad joke <laughs> that's terrible move on to game two I've had enough of that joke uh, Taiwan yeah doesn't have it he just doesn't have it, man. He's saying it for a very long time on this show. The regression was coming, and now it has come in the terms of fatigue, I think more so. But, like, holy fuck, was this dude leaving the ball over the middle of the plate? He just has inviting hit, hard contact. He has hit a wall, and he yes. has hit it so hard. And I can't be upset at him. It's not anything that he can really control. Again, you've mentioned it. 67 and two-thirds innings over the last three years is so, so few innings. So yeah, when a guy is approaching 110 after throwing 67 in three years, you'd imagine his arm is going to start to fall off. And if the Mets had Jacob deGrom and we had Syndergaard back and Carrasco was able to be back to his full health, of course, you're getting the mysterious IL stint where he misses mm -hmm. a couple starts. But the Mets unfortunately have to pitch him every five days still because we got nobody. No, no one that could be better. Like, even Taiwan with half an arm is much better than Gerard Eikhoff. But like, and that's what makes the trade deadline so frustrating that we only got Rich Hill and then mm -hmm. Trevor Williams, who's not even on the Major League roster. The fact knowing that these numbers and stuff were all available to the Mets front office, and you had to know that if you got half a year out of Taiwan, which we did, mm -hmm. and he was great for that half the year, that's a huge plus. Taiwan, we're looking for the future for him. We got the two-year deal for a reason. We knew that this year wasn't going to be a full season. And somehow it seemed like everybody but the Mets knew that. Dude, I think it's um interesting to note that if Taiwan's contract situation was a little bit different, I bet he'd be handled differently. Like, let's just say Taiwan was the super prospect that he once was right now. And injuries had cut a couple of the seasons short, and then he had the COVID season. And we knew we had like four years of control for Taiwan still. And he had the 70 innings over the last three years. I bet he would have hit a hard cap around 100 or 110. But I don't think that the Mets management really cares if his arm falls off. You know, they're doing everything they can. Not everything. They can. Uh, yeah, I think they're doing as much as they think they should be doing to try and win the division this season. And that starts with Taiwan Walker pitching every fifth day. And I don't even think we'd be having this conversation if Taiwan wasn't so lights out in the first half. He was signed, not for like depth, but he we talked about him as the five star. Then we pulled him in off uh, free agency. The fact that he was so dominant, we're like, oh, this guy's a very central piece of this team. Like now we need him to pitch. It's really interesting how our views of him are been different and oscillated as the season has progressed. The whole scope of the Mets season has changed so much week by week, and this week it is down. I wish I could have some positives to pick from Taiwan's start, but there just wasn't a lot. He's hit the wall. He's tired. He has 
the velocity, I guess, is still there. That's that's maybe a positive. Yeah, I've got a couple like weird positives that also tie into negatives because the velocity is totally fine for Taiwan. He's, he was actually up a tick almost every single pitch at the start against Miami. And also, the whiffs are still there. He got 14 and 44 swings. That's right in line with the season average. Honestly, a tiny bit higher. But again, it's just so many hittable pitches. It's mostly the command of everything. I was going to say his off speeds, but he's still not getting the call strikes like he'd been getting in that two-seamer from you know the, the real fun times in summer, May and June. But there were just so many sliders and splitters down the middle. It was over and over again, repeated every inning. When they weren't hitting it hard, the Mets, Mets were just making a play. The Isan Diaz and Alex Jackson home runs were both on splitters that were just like right fucking there on a tee. If you leave that splitter in the middle of the zone, Yeri's Familia will tell you that thing is getting crushed. Yeah. And he was leaving them. He was throwing like high and away. Like he just had absolutely no command no, of it. He lost it. He has nothing. It's just, he's, it's so clearly a step back. And it's so obvious that it's because of fatigue, just because I don't think that we saw this guy's talent. We saw his potential and we saw the way he's mixing. He was mixing his pitches. Now the velocity is still there and it's just not sharp. And there's nothing that's going to make him sharp besides rest. And he's not going to get it. No, not going to get it. Now on the other aspect of things here on the other side of the coin, the Mets offense was friggin' terrible again. So awful. So freaking awful. Tim Britton, Mets beat writer for the Athletic, dropped a crazy stat after this game about the Mets lineup. And especially how poor the Mets lineup has played at the beginning of games. Over the Mets 10 games from game two back, so not including games three and four, because the Mets offense actually did spark a little bit the first couple times through the order. So games one and two, and basically the 10 games back since the All-Star break. The Mets lineup is slashing 208, 315, 260 oh, the first time through the order. God, 260 slugging? Yes. That's so. What is that? That's an OPS of 575. That's like, based on where that average is, that's probably like three or four extra base hits in the first two to three innings. That's so friggin' horrible. It's crazy because. It's not like this lineup is bad right now. The players in this lineup are generally good. Brandon Nimmo's hitting leadoff every day. Well, besides he missed a week, so scratch that. Jeff McNeil, Pete Alonzo, Javi Baez, J.D. Davis, uh, Dom Smith. These guys every single day are in the order and not able to hit. And it's so troubling. I can't believe we're still having this conversation in August. Oh, it's frustrating. We even talked about it a little bit today at the Brooklyn Cyclones game. Chili Davis wasn't the problem. No, but... The, I don't think it's Hugh's problem? problem either. No, yeah, I don't want you to cast blame on Quattlebaum here. No. I just think that how much could a hitting coach do? He can't tell. He can tell the guys like relax, like you're really good. Why are you not hitting? But it's just it's the, it just isn't working. I think it just goes back to the thing of where the Mets seem to be guessing every single time, and this is why you might see a guy like Conforto having the hitter yips, like I said, or Dom being so indecisive at times. Even Alonzo McNeil, like all these guys, like just it seems like we're not swinging at the right pitches. It seems like. Our approach is just absolutely garbage right now. I mean, if it wasn't for Pete Alonso and Brandon Nimmo and McNeil, this team might not have won very many games over the last 10. Well, no, I mean, it seems very easily. It seems very. This team very easily could be on like a 10, 12 game losing streak right now. It wouldn't even be shocking. The few games that we've won, and we'll get to game three in a moment, because that was a, a somewhat of a bright spot in this series. It just seems like such a miracle when we win a game. And, and that is a problem. This lineup. No, it never. I. When's the last easy Mets win? Last easy Mets win. It wasn't this series. Toronto. It wasn't last series. It has to have been Toronto. Yeah. We we're getting screwed up the schedule again. Who would we play in between Toronto and Cincinnati? Last weekday series. Was it Toronto. the Braves? The Braves. The five game series against the Braves. Yeah. Those were difficult games. Didn't score a lot of runs either. Then. No. Really scratched and clawed. Uh, this offense, man, it's rough. I mean, JD, we also got a little insight with him that his hand had been bothering him. That's why he didn't play against the Reds. Mm -hmm. And it looks like his hand's bothering him again because his swings have been god-awful too. Yeah, he like swung right through a 91-mile-an-hour fastball down the dick, and he was like, it's my hand. I was like, why, why are you in the lineup then? Yeah, if you're hurt, you can't be playing. And if the Mets knew he's hurt, how do we not go get a third baseman? I don't know, man. I'm sorry. Like, I, I hate being this guy. I really do. And of course, Monday morning quarterback, you know, whatever you want to call it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. but damn, that Mets deadline's looking worse and worse as the days go on.
You know what's the worst part of this whole deadline and something that I thought about in between you dropping me off from the Cyclones game and then us starting this recording? It's a really sick, disgusting thought, I'm going to tell you, and you're just going to really hurt, but... Oh, boy. Watching highlights from the Bronx tonight and seeing Joey Gallo hit, like, a big home run to give the Yankees a win, the Yankees had the deadline that everyone thought the Mets were going to have, and they're now parlaying it into massive success and a hot streak that is a good chance propels them to the postseason. And it's brutal watching that happen and not having... The prospect capital to make the trades that we wanted to and then not pulling the trigger to give away our better prospects to improve our major league team it hurts like hell and i'm jealous hurts like hell we needed it badly and it's mm-hmm. showing in a series where you can't scratch runs against the friggin florida marlins when they had no pitchers even pitching we didn't face sandy alcantara we didn't face trevor rogers we um, didn't face pa- pablo lopez pablo lopez on the il like we faced nonsense every single game. We couldn't get hits. Braxton Garrett, Zach Thompson. Not not saying those guys don't have a little bit of potential. I like Zach Thompson a little bit. Braxton Garrett looked like Greg fucking Maddox today. But wh- how can you hit those guys? Dude, we couldn't even hit David Hess. Oh, my God. I literally had that note in on this um game. We had a painful inning against the worst pitcher ever, <laughs> David Hess. A career ERA, I think, like in the sixes. That's awesome. That's sick. I love to hear that, too. Lugo starting to scare me a little bit. Well, I don't know if he's starting to scare you. It's just he dies once he hits like 20 pitches now, and the Mets are still committed to using him as a multi-inning dude, and he just isn't that. Like, he had a super clean first inning. I believe that was the seventh. And they trotted him back out, and he was way off, way off. He couldn't couldn't locate anything. I think Castro was on the COVID IL technically still. I think he came off the next game, and of course we find out that Diaz has also gone for paternity leave. I don't yeah. think that really mattered in game two, but maybe a little bit. I don't know. They were trying to maximize their arms as much as possible. Mets bullpen. That would have also been nice to add a little bit to into the in the deadline. Like the Mets yeah. just got the one thing that I think was probably our least concern, which was Javi Baez to play shortstop. Yeah, it's almost like the curse for us, like not wanting Adam Frazier. Now we got the anti Adam Frazier, who's probably still worth like the same amount in like war, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating to just have to go through these games it's painful it is so painful because there's it's, the it, i hate painful. being negative it was awful they one of the best memes i saw that came out of this series from mess twitter i forgot who posted it and i really apologize because i like to give people credit when they post funny stuff on the internet but it was curb your enthusiasm a scene where larry david's walking out of lunch with richard lewis and he goes fuck you i'll see you tomorrow <laughs> that literally was this how entire series that's how literally. i feel watching those mess fuck you guys and i'll see you tomorrow luckily for us the next day at least the mets won at least the Mets won, but like, God, we made it so hard. <laughs> so difficult. Yeah. I, you shouldn't have difficult wins against the Marlins team who sold at the deadline. They didn't try to get better. They got 100% worse. And <laughs> we're their scra- entire starting outfield. Scraping wins against them. We don't have Joe Neshwe Fargus and Jake Hager and Wilfredo Tovar starting. We have all-stars. We have good players. I totally forgot about Jake Hager. He got his first career hit with the Mets, and then we said, yeah. smell you later, DFA, like... <laughs> How badly do we miss Billy McKinney? <laughs> oh, my God. What that would do for Billy McKinney's bat right now. Billy friggin' bombs, man. <laughs> oh, this game, at least, like, the offense made moves early. Like, Dom, Javi, and Conforto all loaded the bases with no outs. I believe it was the second inning. And all three actually came around to score. Miracle. Yeah, just ring the bell. Like, we did it. Like, everyone, <laughs> Merry Christmas, Sayonara, Happy New Year's. Like, let's, let's have a parade. But it was all on like, complete nonsense. Like, it wasn't actually hits or, like, a ball in the gap something that we really cried for in april when we hadn't seen one in felt like weeks like it was a ground ball out and then another ground ball that javi Baez made a superman slide six slide no reason he ever should have been safe on that play and then there was an error like we can't we can never get rbi's traditional way with this team those were runs simply because the marlins are a bad team because they play yeah. bad baseball they don't they, they, play, they, play they make the, baseball no they make the most errors in baseball they swing at the most pitches out of the zone, I believe, and they also take the most strikes. <laughs> they have baseball. no clue what they're doing. I've always said that Donnie Baseball is a god-awful manager. If you ever wanted proof, it's there. You know what they do well, though? Mel Stottlemyle Jr. He's great. He wasn't even here this series. Donnie well, I, Baseball was in the health and safety protocols. No, I know that, but I'm just saying it's it's still his responsibility. When Luis yeah. Rojas steps out and Dave <laughs> Joust wins a game, yeah, we love Dave Joust, but this is Rojas' team still. So. <laughs> 
One of the a big positive from this game was Carrasco. He again just looked very good. Looked like like the top thirty pitcher in baseball he's been for the last five years. He did lose it for sure around fifty pitches once that fifth inning got kind of like dicey, and that's because he's still building up. Like this team is not going to let him go very far past that, especially since he's now shown to struggle at that point. And he's just not going to see a lineup for the third time. He doesn't really seem to have the command of all of his pitches yet. I mentioned last week how Carrasco was throwing all sinkers. That was his thing. This game, it was all sliders. Threw it like 50% of the time, which is something he's done in the past. And had, he's seen a lot of success while doing it. And I think it's an avenue that could make him an incredibly successful starting pitcher. He got eight whiffs on him and 20 swings, which is just fire flames. That's amazing. And he mostly... Used it against righties, which makes sense with a righty throwing righty sliders. And he was just dotting them all, low and outside, low and outside, low and outside. Great command. He'd only thrown four of them to lefties until that Joe Panic at bat in the fifth inning. That seemed to give him a lot of trouble. Joe Panic just... He, what that guy doesn't do with power, he does it with taking good at bats. That guy really makes you work. <laughs> <laughs> and literally, he had only thrown four sliders to lefties that entire game. And he threw three in that at bat against Panic. And he finally left one over the middle, and Panic just made him pay with a fucking single. Yeah, Carrasco, what we've seen so far has been really encouraging. Yes. If you want to pull something positive out of it, it's that if you're a Mets fan, he's not giving you the length right now, but you have to know why. But it's good to see that like he's still very much a very good pitcher when he is like in his zone. Yeah, the bad Mets take of the week is all the mongoloids who are like, you gotta leave this guy in there. He only has 65 pitches. He's pitching a good game. No. This man has dealt with a myriad of health issues over the last couple of years. He needs to just be okay. We need to, like, build him up slowly. He's only pitching right now because the team is in such dire straits. I'm sure if we were okay and, like, generally healthy and not playing the worst baseball I've ever seen, he would be on, like, a month-long rehab assignment. I think, if you're, him. I think if you're a Mets fan, you have to compare and contrast here a little bit. A little Venn diagram. On one side, you got Carlos Carrasco. On one side, you got Jared Eikhoff. And then you've got the middle. Jared Eikhoff is going to give up 10 runs. He's going to stink up the place. And you're going to want to jump off the roof of your building. Carlos Carrasco is going to throw. And he's going to pitch pretty well. He's going to give you a chance. And you go, hey, there's a competent MLB pitcher. The Mm. middle, they're going to go three or four innings. They're going to throw the same length. But one's going to give you a chance to win. And one is completely fucking terrible. I like that. I like giving a visual to the podcast listeners at home. That's a good. That'll play way better on YouTube. Yes, yeah. but it's ridiculous to complain about him. No, especially when he's still giving us a very good chance to win the games he's pitching. Like he pitched very well this game. He did give up two earned runs technically because Loop get let up the inherited runner, which is a shame. Loop never does that, but I'll give him a free pass because he's one of the best relievers in baseball statistically. And we were in this game. We had the three runs early, and then Familia. Just gave up the tying home run to Aguilar. That felt like a backbreaker. One bad pitch. He struck out yeah. the rest of the, the rest of the inning. Oh, yeah. Struck Look out all three. Otherwise. His stuff is still nasty. Jesus Aguilar has just always been a thorn in our side as a Mets fan. He's he's a professional hitter. Leads the league in RBIs. Leads the league in RBIs. So it's no slouch as much as we like to take shots at the Marlins play. Jesus Aguilar is a leader on that team. A guy that I would love to have on the Mets just for a spiritual leader right now. Maybe boost up the spirits because boy, oh boy, there's no leader right now in this field. But that's something he does. He leads by example. Nice home run off Jerry Familia. I'll give credit where it's due. Dude, but you, it's stunk. You defend Jerry Familia like he's your son. I love Jerry Familia. <laughs> you will do anything for him. I will do because listen. All right. Here's my thing with Jerry's Familia. I'm well, today, the, you, you missed his inning today. Well, hey, <laughs> hey, I wasn't watching, so that doesn't count. If I don't see it, it doesn't happen. Of course. But like, I feel like Mets fans are so quick to say Jerry's Familia is trash. And he's not the best. No. But I think if you watch this guy pitch and don't realize that like his wildness is not because he's like actually terrible his pitches simply just move too much sometimes like there's a couple nights where he's gonna throw a sinker and it breaks 18 inches he's like i can't where do you want me to throw this i physically can't ever throw it for a strike it's not possible it's black magic he's he's a witch on the mound sometimes but (laughs) and other times he's like this where he gives up a home run and then strikes out the next three batters yeah it happens and luckily our actual trade deadline acquisition javi baez really saved the day in this game. This was the Javi Baez MVP game. This was the top end of the Javi Baez experience. You saw the slide. You saw him play good defense. Mm -hmm. You saw him hit a home run. That's what gets people excited about Javi Baez is when he plays like this. The problem is the rest of the series, he was pretty much non-existent. 
I think he struck out 10 times. He he well, had the platinum sombrero today, I think you said, yeah. which is jumping ahead a little bit. But he is so... What's the word where you're like uh, all over the place? Inconsistent. Inconsistent? No. Volatile. Yeah, volatile. He is He's a so volatile, volatile player. So you're going to get the good. You're going to get the bad. Today was the good in game three. It's the Javi. Not today. That was a couple days ago now. I yeah. Know. It's, I, I, it's so late. I'm tired. It's a long day. I've been up he, since 8 a.m., which doesn't sound like a lot. But you're talking <laughs> to a guy who goes to bed at three. So I'm like running around five hours of sleep, a long day in the sun. I'm dying. <laughs> Especially talking about this awful godforsaken series, but Javi saved the day. We're gonna give the guy shit when he swings on three and zero and takes himself out of an at bat. We're gonna give him all the credit in the world when he wins the Mets game, and he won the Mets this game. Yes, he Mets did. don't he- win this game without Javi Bias. That was clutch. He has that top end that not many other players in baseball do, and is very happy to see him use it. Yep. And luckily for us, Drew Flo, Trevor May come in to shut the door at the end of the game. They both mm-hmm. looked sick. They both looked oh, awesome. Two great innings. I thought it was interesting to note that. Drew Flo came into pitch after Castro and Familia, which I think shows like maybe a bit of the changing of the guard in this bullpen and how, based after our prediction, Drew Flo has ascended into one of the more trusted relievers in this bullpen. He's officially on the A team. I'll put yes. him there at least while Diaz is on paternity leave. Drew Flo is on the Mets A team, which is awesome because you called it very much so, and I jumped on the bandwagon yeah. right with you. So the Drew Flo podcast, good looks for us as always. Love Drew Flo, and we got to win. Needed it badly because so badly. I I think after the first two games, I was a little negative. I tweeted out, I feel like Frank the Tank, which <laughs> that's about the lowest of low that you could ever go as a Mets fan. I think you said I am Frank the Tank. Uh, yeah, whatever it was, it was bad, and I was like so negative and so down. This win at least saved my sanity, but it just went completely out the door in Game Four. If we would have gotten swept in this series, I would have I would have laid down in traffic. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i i don't know what i would have done <laughs> i would have just kept walking into the ocean in coney island and see how far i can go i bricks to my feet there was a funny meme that uh the cespas barbecue barbecue guy posted today after he finished his um his bike ride from new york to chicago which is just insane behavior it was uh <laughs> he got to the lake in chicago and it was a video of someone just biking not stopping right over the edge <laughs> and just landing in the water with their bike that that's what we both would have done if the mets would have gotten swept four games in miami but, but we were we lucky we only lost three thank god save thank the season baby our lives are still intact here because yeah. they only lost three because <laughs> oh game four disaster wow uh talk about the epitome of the met season bases loaded no outs love a good single by dom smith he's he's mm-hmm. the single man this year extra base hits not interested singles Yes. Barrels? Never heard of her. Never heard of her. Bases loaded, no outs. You knew it was coming. You knew. JD strikes out. Javi Baez has an uncom- in- uncompetitive at-bat. That, when Javi Baez stepped to the plate, there was a 100% chance the Mets were not scoring a run. Oh, yeah. F- F- factual. Just, especially after hitting the game-winning home run the day before, he was so excited to just like catapult the Mets season with another first-inning grand slam. And he was just swinging out. Out of his shoes. It's Javi Baez. All we needed was a fly ball. Yep. And then Conforto came up. And I mean, come on. You really think Michael Conforto is going to be able to score a run? Now, he did work the count 2-0. He did did get screwed on a low strike call. That was a ball. Which then, he got it to 3-1. Forced him, though, to swing at this pitch. He swung at ball four. And we score no runs. And I tweeted out the, ah, shit, here we go again meme. Because, (laughs) my God. Once that happens, it was over. It didn't matter that it was 0-0. The Mets lost the game. Rich Hill didn't even pitch bad. No, the pitched, just, he actually pitched well. Yeah, the offense is just anemic. It was also a real just, like, swift kick in the dick that Rich Hale came up twice with men in scoring, but not men in scoring position, but he came up twice in run-producing opportunities. The double play in the bunt, and then when he came out, came up in the fourth after Almora's single with first and third and two outs, it's just, this is, this is I wrote in the notes, this is your time to yeah, are you Are you happy? DH. Are you fucking happy? This is what you wanted? You wanted to see Rich Hill and his 42-year-old ass swing a bat? In my defense, the Mets did not have Rich Hill when I was talking about supporting you the no to see DH. Carlos Carrasco, Taiwan, Taiwan Walker went up left-handed in the game that he pitched because he was like, ah, shit, I can't hit righty. You wanted to see the, these pitchers swing and bunt. This is the baseball you're interested in. I've been proven wrong. I still like double switches, but no, now knowing I think- <laughs> how much a DH would help this team, although maybe it wouldn't, because maybe this yeah, is no, the worst. You want another hitter? Yeah, can we get Degrom to DH? I know he can't throw. No. Can he swing a bat? 
No. <laughs> Absolutely uh, not. I fucking hate pitchers hitting. It is so infuriating, especially when we've had multiple pitchers get hurt from hitting this year. That's the worst part. <laughs> we didn't even talk about the injuries that it's caused. No, I also, I couldn't even... I couldn't even keep a straight face watching Braxton Garrett just dot up 92 over and over again. 90 Guys. even. How, why was he a first round pick? Soft tossing lefty. Yeah, it happened again. Happened again. Do the Mets like, are they, do they have a, uh, a phobia of left-handed pitchers that throw low 90s? <laughs> you gave me the take today, I think you saw on Twitter, that Dave Jaffs just throw too good of BP. So the Mets Twitter can't is. actually hit in the games. We're starting to try to come up with these crazy reasons as to why this Mets team just refuses to hit. Dave Jaffs just throws too good BP. They too good. only look for pitches down the middle. But even then, the Mets don't make pitchers pay for their mistakes. No. Got to be the worst at like, I wish there was a stat. You can't there find it. Stat. It doesn't exist. No, for hanging pitches. I want hangers. Well, I want to know the percentage of pitches that the Mets hit that are hanging and make out or make like positive outcomes on I, they just don't you, do it no if you give me five minutes we could find that right now in savant i'll use the search tool and we'll do breaking balls heart of the zone all right fine do that the mess of the seventh lows will open breaking pitches in the down the middle sick that's dope can you tell me the teams underneath the mets just just okay. interested it's uh it varies actually because some of these are pretty bad but some of these are actually quite good the worst by far is the san diego padres which is shocking hmm. 236 woba on breaking balls in the heart of the zone and then dodgers are second to worst then Yankees, White Sox, Brewers, Rays. Well, that, wait, for the worst? Shockingly, yes, those are the worst. Those are the lowest. Those are all good teams. I'm so confused. Yeah, maybe they just hit the other pitches way better. Yeah, probably. All right, anyway, we dove deep into the numbers. It clearly is non-conclusive as to whether or not this is actually <laughs> important, but it's true the Mets don't do it. Yes, and all, all those teams do have... Um, pretty big gaps between their Wobas and their ex Wobas. The Mets, of course, do not. So a lot of those, especially the Padres, the Yankees especially, wow. And the race, it seems like a lot of it's attributed to bad, bad ball luck. Yeah, well. Mets don't have any of that. Mets have no good luck nor bad luck. They I'd just love don't to have the some bad hard. luck right now. Oh, bad luck would be sick. Hitting the ball hard and someone making a play. It's so much worse to just stink. Yes. And than to stink. have bad luck. Dead as a door now. We did, like, have a little bit of life in the seventh. Loaded the bases after the VR, um... If you had the ribby single, gave us a tiny bit of life, like a tiniest little bit of shot of life. If we were on the uh, the machine at the hospital, we'd be like, beep, boop, beep. There's a little bit of life. And then Dom puts one to the track on an 0-2 pitch. Against, yeah. Again, my guy David fucking Hess. <laughs> Worst pitcher in baseball. Uh, I mean, Dom, man, when's the last time that guy really hit a ball hard? It just doesn't know. feel like often anymore. September 08. <laughs> <laughs> We've just got the, it feels like the old Dom's back a little bit here. The guy who... Is a singles hitter. Will walk occasionally. <laughs> the old Dom can mean like a really good Dom or a really bad Dom. You have to specify the old Dom when you say that now. The Dom that did not sleep well. Yeah, sleep apnea Dom. I'm I'm serious. Is this whole team not sleeping? Are they not getting? Nutri <laughs> are they not eating the right foods? We, we're clearly not stretching and drinking water. We know that. <laughs> There's what else is going wrong? Dramatically wrong. What this team does between the hours of like eleven and five. I would love to just be a fly on the wall and see what's going on because it's just got to be incorrect. <laughs> it's creepy as fuck. Well, yeah, all right, fine. It is creepy. Let's pick up a positive here. Castro, good inning. Yeah. No, seems pretty back. Two days in a row, we get clean innings. Stuff all seems good. Command's back. Just had, like, relievers just kind of do this. You'll just have to be really bad for, like, a few weeks. And it looks like the world is crashing down. But they're all just high-variance players. They throw really hard for a short period of time. Which Sometimes is why you're good. Sometimes you're bad. Which is why I think Castro's probably getting bumped down a little bit. And you're seeing yeah. Drew Flo come up. I think Drew Flo is just a little more consistent. And you know what you're going to get on a given day out of him. Mm -hmm. Pretty safely, Miguel Castro has the option to be unhittable, but he also has the option where he walks the bases loaded to Vladimir Gutierrez. Yeah, it, it happens. All these things happen within Miguel Castro's range of outcomes, and that's yeah. a wild ride that the Mets take very often. Now, uh, let's talk about my guy that I defend. Yeah. Jerry Familia did not have it. Certainly did not have it. He did the classic Familia, the walk, single, single. Usually it's a walk, walk, single, or a single, walk, walk, or a walk, walk, walk. But today it was a walk single single and uh, it's to friggin' Lewis Brinson. Dude, he hit, it was like 109 off the bat. That was a laser beam. The Mets might single handedly be responsible for reviving Lewis Brinson's career. He, you want to talk about dead as a doornail. 
Yeah. That guy is only playing because they traded away every other outfielder in this organization. The other option is Magnaris Sierra, who's essentially a 12-year-old playing center field. <laughs> He's a good defender, damn. <laughs> he, can't, essentially, he, he would be like the most physically mature 12-year-old I've ever seen. He could throw the ball farther than he can hit it. <laughs> that's, prob- <laughs> that's probably completely true. But if this actually becomes a turning point in Lewis Brinson's career, I'm going to be irate. Because there should be no turning point. He's bad. But the Mets, like we said at the beginning, made him look not bad. Made him look okay. No, he looked fine. And we did make some noise in the ninth off of my guy, Anthony Bender, who I shouted out in this podcast in like May. I really called the Anthony Bender to come up. That was crazy. But it's just really bittersweet when the Mets have a rally and Albert Almora (laughs) is up. Brandon Drury just got an infield single. Kevin Pilar is on deck. It's like, what are we doing here? Nothing's going to happen. When did Albert Almora get back on this team, by the way? Like two days ago. <laughs> I like completely forgot he existed for a bit, and I think my life was better when Albert Almora was out of my brain. I had a moment this series where I was thinking, wow, if only we had Jose Peraza on this roster. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it was such a gross place to be. Uh, Albert Almora. And by the way, we we're only still in that in because the Marlins made two errors. Yeah, they just were incompetent. Bad baseball. Bad baseball team. It's just simply that way. Moral of the story we're in trouble yeah we're just to transition to our phillies preview i am petrified of what's going to happen this weekend i don't want to say it because i have respect for myself but i am shaking in my boots to face the (laughs) phillies i to to all the listeners at home i've been trying to egg mark to go to this game tomorrow night and he gave me a vivacious no (laughs) no there's no chance there's no No. chance i'm not welcome in the city of philadelphia i've said a lot of really bad things about the people the city their culture (laughs) their food i take a shot any chance i can because i believe it that place is a cesspool that's where the human trash goes to live they're a bunch of mutants and it's the asshole of america they want to talk about jersey being the armpit at least we're not the asshole you guys ate shit there was a guy who literally ate horse shit that was cleveland no, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Oh, really? Cleveland Guy, ate horseshit. Cle- I think you're mi- possibly mixing up two stories. Because Cleveland, 100%, <laughs> after the Cavs won the championship, someone ate horseshit on no, the I street. think they copied the Eagles. I think they were like, we got to do crazy no, stuff. No, the Cavs won before the Eagles. You fucking mental more. What There's are you talking no about? way. I, I, I'm, I am so positive. You don't live on the internet and not know who ate shit. It was the fucking Cavs, man. All right, well, also, well, I'm, I'm looking this up right now. We're taking another <laughs> Jeopardy break here. <laughs> Boop. Eagles, fan... Eats poop. Eagles <laughs> fan eats horse poop. Well, Cleveland during, did it too then. During their Super Bowl win. No, we're going to look into... Did a Browns fan... Br- no, Cleveland... Oh, well, Browns fans are Cavs fans. Yeah, Cleveland... Cavs... Fan... This is <laughs> wild. The eats. algorithm's going to be insane. A Cleveland fan also ate horse poop. And that would happen first. Check the receipts. 2016, you're right. Okay. Regardless... <laughs> any place that eats poop is not a place for me. And any place that also has threatened me and said, if you, if I see you in Philadelphia, it's on site, <laughs> call me a pussy all you want. They're going to kick my ass. I'm 5'9", yeah. 150 pounds. I'm not going to win. Yeah, it'd be tough for you and I to walk into Citizens Bank Park, 300 pounds together soaking wet. We would not stand up in a fight against drunk Philadelphians. No. Come to City Field, at least if I'm getting beat on, someone else will join in and help. We're outnumbered in Philadelphia, and there's nothing scarier than a bunch of drunk Philadelphia people who hate me. That terrifies me. I don't need to put this my life in risk like this. In terms of the games themselves, they actually line up kind of okay for the Mets. It's really not that bad. Stroman versus Kyle Gibson on Friday night. That's that's really our shot here. We have to win that game. And no, I'm serious. Like we have to win that game and just try to make people feel okay. Because if Strowman loses to Kyle Gibson, McGill's going against Ranger Suarez Saturday afternoon, the 4 o'clock game. I love the 4 o'clock game. But Suarez is good. He's only going to throw three innings, but he's going to be very effective when he does it. That's probably going to be a Suarez piggybacked by either Matt Moore or Bailey Falter if he's recalled from his rehab assignment after being in the COVID IL. Bailey Falter's a guy I like a lot. I don't know if he's going to pitch, so he's not my Philly to watch, but the guy's great stuff. What about Chase Anderson? Chase Anderson? No, he's not pitching. But we really fucked that one up. No, he he might pitch uh, game two if he's picking back off of Ranger. I believe Ranger. he pitched on Wednesday. He either pitched okay. Tuesday or Wednesday. So I don't think we're going to see him. But I mean, he probably only threw an inning and a half because he fucking sucks nuts. So 
Whatever. And then Sunday afternoon, we're going to watch Zach Wheeler destroy us. <laughs> Dice us up on his way oh, to winning the Cy Young. It's going to be awful to watch. It's going to be hot. They're going to be hungover. And Zach Wheeler is going to annihilate the mess. He's going to throw seven shutout innings, 10 Ks, three hits, one walk. And Taiwan Walker is going to just casually give up five runs in six innings. Can't stress enough how important it is to win game one. Because if yes. the Mets lose, they get rid of the first place grasp for the first time in over two months. Yeah. And let me tell you, if you thought Mets Twitter was bad right now, as bad. soon as the Phillies overtake first place, it is going to be the SpongeBob mean of everything's on fire and running yeah. around and like, what do we do? It is going to be chaos. It is going to be hell. And I'm terrified. I am so scared for this series. J2 Real Muto scorching hot. Bryce Harper scorching hot. He's getting MVP talks, Harper. I, I think he has a good chance he wins it. I said at the beginning of the year, he had great odds to start. He was like plus 1,200. I'm like, that's weird. They're a competitive team. He plays in a band box, and he's sick. It's a good bet. Your boy has Trey Turner plus 5,000 right now. Everyone, I wish they would have read my um my pitcher list awards uh preview beginning of the season. I had Trey Turner on there plus 5,000 for MVP, and Brandon Woodruff plus 2,500 for Cy Young. Those guys are both around plus 400 right now. Two of the favorites in their respective awards. Follow me on Twitter. I give great advice. It is imperative that the Mets win this series. At least we have to win on Friday night. The Mets, Marcus Stroman has to go out there and put this team in a spot to win. And the Mets just have to hit three home runs off Kyle Gibson. We have to. We always hit when we go to Philadelphia. Always, always, always. And Kyle Gibson is such a good ground ball pitcher. He's the perfect trade candidate to go to Philadelphia. Of course, he does give up some fly balls. No one gives up no fly balls. He's very good. He only gives up like 30%. That's way lower than league average. But we just got to find those cheap-ass bullshit seats in this fucking band box and get it over the wall like we did in Cincinnati. Will this team to a couple wins with our bats? This team's got to wake up. This is a huge series for the outlook of this team. This is a huge series for the season. It's a huge series for the future, I think. I think this series will tell a lot about this team going forward. At least this season. I don't think that the rest of the season is going to tell much about the future because we do have to remember the Mets are playing without Jacob deGrom, Noah Syndergaard, and Francisco Lindor. Arguably, not arguably, no, unquestionably three of the five best players on this team, talent and skill-wise. Two, The number one and two, and then Noah Syndergaard, who's a perennial all-star when he is healthy. So go. this rough stretch shouldn't really be unexpected, and we have hinted at it, and we said, like, this is going to be difficult, and we've been doing the replace Mets all year, and we've been finding a way. But losing your two best players hurts like hell, and it's really killing this team right now. Killing this team. Huge series. We're going to be watching very closely, and hopefully we get some Ws, and hopefully... We're feeling excited about this team. One thing we are excited about, though, mm -hmm. was our little Brooklyn experience. Let's just give you guys a little insight here yeah. because this was James' first ever time being able to get on the field, I believe, as like a media personnel, mm -hmm. interview players, get to interact with some guys on the field, coaches, all this kind of stuff. I'd love to get your take because I've obviously done this for the last few spring trainings, and the first time I ever did it, I was blown away. It was sick. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm interested I was to see how you feel. I was like in awe, like for the first hour we were there today. And just like to pull the curtain back for the listeners at home, we made a connection with the Cyclones general manager. Uh, last month we went to the game, we posted a bunch of stuff on social, had a great time. And general manager of a minor league team isn't like anything with player movement because, of course, the major league general manager handles the player movement of the minor league teams. So he's really just like a guy who does things and promotions. So I used him to get in contact with the Cyclones VP of communications. I literally harassed him for like a month. Just sending him emails and emails and emails, constantly trying to get this happen. He answered me at the clear blue sky on a Saturday afternoon, like a week and a half ago. I was shocked. I sent it to Mark because I couldn't believe he finally got back to me. Set this up like really by happenstance this week. Wrote up some questions. We're really praying we were going to get to interview the top guys like Alvarez and Mauricio and Palmer and JT Ginn. And it really all came through. And it was just so like... um. I don't know. I felt so good like being there and having this happen and work out. Like it was so smooth, shockingly so. Just being able to like rub shoulders with two of the best prospects in baseball was such a amazing experience. My heart was racing when we were talking to Francisco Alvarez. Racing. Well, for those of you guys who don't know, so like James said, we had the four guys on our list. Mm -hmm. So we don't really get to decide who we talk no. to. It's pretty much who the guy brings us. And I know this is weird to say because they're like younger than us, they're like twenty year old kids. So like for us not to go up to them and be like, hey, can I talk to you? Still a little weird. Still not completely comfortable with that, even myself. So the guy brings us the players. He's like, I'll get you the guys. I'll let you know when they're ready. 
taking BP, whatever. We're seeing Ronnie sit down. We're thinking like, ah, maybe not. He was a little quiet. Yeah. He was kind of just to himself off to the side. Mm-hmm. Didn't really seem completely into it. The guy talked to him and he just kind of didn't give a huge answer. Not that he should be like, oh my God, the Mets the podcast. But <laughs> he just didn't seem like he really cared. And that's fine. I, yeah. I'm not asking for him to care. It's not that big of a deal. No. But then he and, brought us Jalen Palmer, which yeah. was nice. He was our first guy that we talked to, and he'll probably be the first episode that we drop mm-hmm. with an interview. And Jalen, I know, kind of, sort of, follows me on Twitter. We shared the same agent for a bit. So there had been a little bit of a relationship there of sorts. So it was good, and it was a great way for James to get comfortable, too, because mm-hmm. that was your first time ever interviewing a player. Yeah. And as you said, after that interview, you felt super, super comfortable. A hundred percent. I was probably a little, I'll admit I was a little bit shook when we were interviewing Jalen Palmer. And not that Jalen Palmer is this like grand star or anything, but this is just the first time I'd ever been in that environment, like with a player, like asking questions, like trying to um, like put the journalism hat on, like get something out of them. It's a, it's a weird experience. I'm very happy that he was first, especially because he was our only interview that we did without a translator, which yes. presented a new and unique set of challenges, which was still fun. Yeah, shout out to our boy, Ernie. Mm-hmm. Sub tape. We've talked about him on the podcast before. The biggest Jonathan VR fan. Mm-hmm. Make sure you guys throw him a follow. He was our translator for all these interviews that you're going to be hearing. At sub tape underscore. If you can do anything to help us out besides, you know, watching and listening to the podcast, drop him a follow. Really deserves it. He's going to be huge for us in these interviews coming up here that you guys are going to listen to. Mm-hmm. Super exciting stuff. All really good interviews. Jalen, of course, going to be all English, so that'll probably be like the easiest to follow. Yeah. But we got some great answers out of Ronnie Mauricio, who we were told was a little, I don't want to say stiff, but a little hesitant at times, a little shy. I, I would call him shy, yeah. Especially talking to two guys who, like, you're speaking to them in a different language, you know? It's hard to communicate like that. And the Cyclones people told us that these guys, especially Ronnie and Francisco, they get interviewed all the time. There's journalists, reporters, bloggers, podcasters, beat writers knocking on their door every single day to talk to these guys. So I understand their um, uh, hesitancy to just do it again, you know, because it seems like everyone probably asked them the same five questions. But I don't think we did that. And you guys are really going to hear in the interview some real interesting and kind of funny and it's a little bit nuanced questions that we asked these guys. I'm really able to pull back the, the curtain and... Hope for everyone to kind of build up a relationship with two guys who seem like they're going to be with this organization for a very long time. Before we get going towards the end here, which one was your favorite interview? What do you got to say? What do you think? Uh, it was absolutely Francisco. He's electric. He is so much fun. You guys, if you, uh, everyone, all the Mets fans, I feel like love him already because he's so good. But and he oh is my God. so good. He's different. He is so good. This dude's personality is A1, top notch. Like, he is the type of guy you want to build your entire organization around. He's hysterical, man. And, and he's we thought, so smart. We thought we weren't going to get him, too. He yeah, was our was last tight. guy that we got. It mm-hmm. was right before the game. And the guy and he told was, us, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, he thought we were going to get JT Ginn. We got Francisco Alvarez and said, sorry, JT, we'll be out there at some point. Grab you again at some point. Yeah, I think we'll make another trip to Brooklyn. But No doubt. He, from the get-go, was talking it up. I was testing the microphones out. He came by, hello, hello. Like, he, yeah. was, he was doing his thing. He was super comfortable in front of the camera, super comfortable talking. Rocking shades. Rocking shades, popping out the chest hair mm-hmm. with the chains and everything. Like, he's a really cool guy. I think you guys are going to really enjoy these interviews. Alvarez is my favorite one, too. But the Ronnie and Jalen Palmer ones are really good, too. So make mm-hmm. sure that you're following the Twitter, the Instagram, the YouTube channel, because you'll get videos of these interviews. You'll get Mm -hmm. to see these guys talking. If you ever subscribe to the YouTube channel, I think the interviews are going to be worth it. Those are going to be coming in the next few weeks during the midweek episodes instead of the farm reports. Of course, you'll be able to listen to the audio version as well if YouTube's not your thing. But again, I really do think the video version will be the best way to watch those kinds of episodes. 100%. And... Before we start the sign off here, I want to shout out the Brooklyn Cyclones for being very accommodating to us, giving us media passes with almost no background check whatsoever being done. We just asked and we received. Got to hang out in the field for hours. We watched BP live, which was such an amazing experience. Listening to Francisco Alvarez and Ronnie Mauricio hit baseballs was jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring. It just sounded different off their bat. Well, I've told you, like, and I don't think you can really understand until you actually experience it. I told yeah. you about my list of guys that take BP differently, mm-hmm. and you can see it. It's so Instantly. obvious. It's instant. You're like, that ball's hit different. That guy yeah. is different. It's a little bit different when Francisco Alvarez is hitting ropes into the left field gap, and uh, uh, what's what, uh, No Glove Joe, or Joey No, no Gloves. Joey No Gloves, Joe what Swoozy, or whatever. Joe, Joe Swoozy. He had a great game today, and we were there. He hit a, hit a triple, two RBIs, made a diving play in right field. Seems like a fine little single-A player. 
but the ball just sounds very different coming off his bat than Francisco Alvarez. Yeah, no, it was, it was an incredible experience. Super thankful to the Brooklyn Cyclones. Mm-hmm. Super excited to show you guys that content. As for episode number 30 of the Mets Up podcast, that's where we're going to start to sign off. Follow James on Twitter at Jeter Had No Range, me at Giraffe Neck Mark. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Mets Up. Follow us on the YouTube channel, Mets Up Podcast, if you're interested in the video content, as always. Mm-hmm. Philly series is going to be probably the most important series of the season. Hopefully, we come out of it on top. It'll be real interesting. Episode number 39 next next or Monday, I guess, of the Mets Up Podcast will be interesting. There is no go, doubt. Yeah, it could definitely go two different ways. You're either going to get me crying and screaming and laying in traffic, as James has said, <laughs> or we're going to be shouting from the rooftops, and we're going to be yeah. partying, or maybe there's not a lot of excitement. Who knows? As long as the Mets are in first place at the end of this series, I'm feeling good. Thank mm-hmm. you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Messed Up Podcast. Peace out. See you guys next time.